I'd like to introduce someone who I witnessed pour his heart out, pour his heart and his soul into not only his talk, but also in his own rehabilitation and redemption. Everybody, give it up for Michael Grayson. It's a real honor to speak here today. I appreciate everyone's attention. When I was first given the opportunity to speak here today, I was apprehensive. I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. So I did what I normally do during times of uncertainty. I called my sister, Nicole. Nicole's two years younger than I am. She's my best friend, my rock, my everything. Of course, she hit me with words of encouragement. You know, you should do it. It's a great opportunity. It'll be good for you. I knew she was right. It would be good, cathartic even. But I still wasn't sure. So I called her back a few days later. She asked me what I was going to do. I told her, I really don't know. She said, hold on a second. Now, little did I know that earlier in the day, she had picked up my son, Mikey. Mikey's 13 years old, and he was going to be spending a few days with my sister. So Mikey gets on the phone, and he's all animated. He says, hey, Dad, I hear you're doing a TED Talk. That's awesome. I guess I'm doing it. <laughs> they even wanted to come up here today to hear me speak. I told them they wouldn't be permitted to come inside. They said, that's OK. We'll just sit in the parking lot. This way you know that we're here for you. I had to convince them not to drive three hours to sit in a parking lot. And that's the kind of love and support that I've been blessed to have the last decade plus of incarceration. Family, friends, even complete strangers. I got a letter from a guy back home when I was in downstate. He said, hey, Michael, that could have been me a thousand times. Keep your head up. You're going to get through this. God bless you. We're still in touch eight years later. He just wrote a letter to the parole board on my behalf. But no one has been in my corner more than my sister, Nicole. It's always been that way with her and I. You know, growing up, we were inseparable. I was the overprotective brother. A little too much at times. You know, she could never have a boyfriend or anything like that. I always wanted to make sure that she was OK and nothing bad ever happened to her. And it's this special relationship that I have with my sister that's really instilled in me a sense of compassion and empathy for others to the point where I would never hurt anyone, especially a woman, especially a young woman. But um, that's exactly what I did. On June 24th of 2012, my life was forever changed. That was the day I caused the death of a beautiful young woman. Her name was Brittany Walsh. She was 18 years old. She had just graduated high school, just attended her senior prom. She was enrolled in college. Brittany had a graduation party to attend that night. But she decided not to go. Instead, she picked up an extra shift at work so she could save money for college. And I was out with friends that night. And I was drinking. And I was intoxicated. I made the choice. I decided to drive home that night. You know, I never considered myself selfish. I would always put others before myself. But getting behind the wheel that night was the ultimate act of selfishness, recklessness, indifference, the result of which has been unimaginable, never-ending pain and suffering for many, many people. You know, I could blame addiction or intoxication, but that's a cop-out. I have an amazing family that just wanted me to do better. 
I had a beautiful wife and a three-year-old son at home. It's not addiction. It's me. It's my fault. 100% my fault. So I was on my way home that night, about a mile away. And people always tell me, man, you were so close. A mile, a hundred miles, it doesn't matter. In fact, in my eyes, the proximity makes it that much more egregious because it would have been a $5 cab ride. So we were both on our way home that night, close to our houses. I wound up rear-ending her car. It flipped over and she died instantly. My car hit a telephone pole and I was knocked unconscious. I was barely injured when I was rushed to the hospital, oblivious to the fact that I had just killed someone. No, I didn't find out until the next night, when I was handcuffed to a hospital bed, surrounded by police. It felt like the whole world just collapsed right on top of me. I couldn't scream, I was numb. All I could think about was, did she have any siblings? What her parents were going through what my parents were going through. I was destroyed. And that's the first time I seriously contemplated suicide. It definitely wasn't gonna be the last. Now my niece, my niece Ava, she's 10 years old. She was born June 26th of 2012 in the same hospital that I was at. So while my sister my best friend, my soulmate really, while she was giving birth to her first and only child, I was one floor below, handcuffed, surrounded by police. What was supposed to be a joyous day for my family was overshadowed by what I had done two days prior. You know, someone really close to me, you know, she was mad at me at the time. She said, you know, you really ruined the childbirth experience for your sister. You just ruined it. She was right. I did. That was day two. There's a lot more pain and suffering to come. But what me and my family were going through at the time pales in comparison to what the Walsh family were going through. Now they were really suffering. It still makes me nauseous when I think about what I did to them. So after languishing in county jail for almost three years, I was sent up north with an indeterminate sentence of 10 and two thirds to 32 years. You know, family and friends tell me, man, you got railroaded. You got way too much time. It was an accident. It was unintentional. I always tell them no. Of course it was unintentional. But that doesn't change the result. It doesn't change all the lives that were destroyed by my reckless actions that day. No, I had it coming. And I got exactly what I deserve. Now, when I entered docs, I had a plan to dedicate myself to sobriety, physical fitness, and maintaining a positive attitude so I can get home to my family at the earliest possible time. Now, sobriety, I shouldn't even have to mention, but I will. June 24th of 2012 was the absolute last day an intoxicant entered this body. Any other way, and I wouldn't be able to look my son in his eyes, or my sister, or myself. Now, physical fitness has always been my salvation, even before I got locked up. When I'm taking really good care of my body, usually a healthy mind follows. Usually. Now the third one was going to be the most difficult. Maintaining a positive attitude in prison is not an easy task. There's a lot of negativity, misery, and despair inside these walls. Especially when you're locked in a cell. Now that's where I would become my own worst enemy. That's where the ugly thoughts of suicide would return. I had this twisted logic where maybe if I just offed myself, 
somehow a burden would be lifted from my family. They wouldn't have to drive three hours to come see me, answer my phone calls, or worry about me making the parole board. And just maybe the Walsh family would have some sense of relief knowing that I was dead. But deep down, I knew it wasn't the answer. It would only make things a million times worse, and it would make me completely irredeemable. But no matter how much I worked out or tried to stay positive, I couldn't escape this black cloud of profound guilt and regret. It was all consuming, debilitating at times. I was constantly thinking about Brittany and her family, replaying that day over and over again. It should have been me, not her. Wishing I could just give up my life to bring her back. I had this constant knot in my chest, walking around always with the thousand yard stare. You know, guys would come up to me and say, Mikey, snap out of it. You're always in your head. You're always stressed out. I knew they were right though. I had to fix this. One day I'm gonna get released and my family's depending on me. I have to be a father, a brother, a son. I have to be strong physically and mentally. But what else can I do? What else is there? In 2017, I was very fortunate to be selected to the hospice program here at Kuksaki. And what a wonderful program it is. They put us through a 40-hour training course, after which we're able to provide hospice care for terminal incarcerated individuals in the RMU. Now these guys are suffering, and they're all alone. You know, we'll help them write letters to their families, make sure they're getting their fluids, but most importantly, we provide companionship. Now I like to lighten the mood right away. I'll try to get them to smile or laugh with a funny story or a joke. But that's what they want. They don't talk much, but they listen. When they're put in their final days, when they're in their final days, they're put in what's called a 24-hour vigil, meaning they have a hospice aide present with them for 24 hours until they pass. Now is when they're really scared. Now, during a vigil, I like to get really close. I'll put my hand on their forearm, or I'll hold their hand, and I'll just let them know, hey, I'm here. We're here together. You're not alone. It's going to be okay. I'll make sure they're very comfortable, and I'll keep repeating it until they pass. Now, I had a patient one time. He was from my area. He had committed heinous crimes against women back in the 80s when I was growing up. They called him the Long Island Rapist. I actually know one of his victims, but that didn't change anything. I treated him just like I treat all the others because that's what the program is all about. Compassion and mercy. And it's so rewarding, so mutually beneficial. And you know, after about a year or so of hospice, I started to notice a change. It wasn't so difficult to maintain that positive attitude anymore. I started encouraging other incarcerated individuals to do better, to come work out with me get their GED, join Bard College or hospice. And of course, those thoughts of suicide are completely gone. I still have that knot of immense pain and guilt, and I always will. But it's become more bearable, and I'm learning to live with it. You know, before I got locked up, I was living with blinders on. I always wanted to make sure that my family was okay. I was taking care of only what's mine. But there's more to life than that. I have a responsibility to help others too. It's a virtue that I can't wait to share with my son. I know my family's depending on me. But now I also know complete strangers are depending on me too. Whether it's through volunteer work at a hospice facility back home or a high school, or a college campus. Any place 
where I can share my story and hopefully intervene in people's lives that are headed down the same path that I was in 2012 and help them avoid catastrophe. But no matter what I do, I'm always brought back to the Walsh family. They're always right here, front and center. When I go to bed at night, when I wake up in the morning, and they always will be. At my sentencing in January of 2015, I told the Walsh family that I would grieve with them for the rest of my life. And I haven't stopped since, and I never will, because they matter most of all. Thank you.